Orlando, Florida, you are listening to the most electrifying show in media on Neighbors Choice. And I'm your host, your neighbor, David Gronoski. So glad to be with you here. We are live and we're having a great time because we are about to cover the most important debate of the century. We're not talking about the Democrat debate. That's yesterday's news, and I'll give you a spoiler alert. They're going to come out with a new proposal because the cow farts they're worried about, they're causing so much methane production that it's going to destroy the entire world in a ball of fire. They've announced tonight all of them are joining in a coalition to execute every cow that exists on earth as a mass calling to sacrifice to the God of Gaia behind the climate catastrophe and avert inevitable death. So all those vegans, don't worry about that methane production from the cows because all millions and millions and millions of cows, actually billions I think we're up to worldwide, they're going to be rounded up and murdered tonight. That's what they're planning to do. That's what we got to look forward to. I kid you, but we're, we're really close to that actually being a reality with the meat tax and everything else that's coming down from those guys and girls. But in the meantime, we're going to talk about something more important, and that's what should we eat? What is the fuel that should fuel our bodies? What is the primary food source? And you know the ketogenic diet is really popular. It's really, it's a fad, right? And uh, it's, it's ascendant. But still, the establishment is still pretty pro-carb. And it's complicated, right? There are, they, the, the establishment would say there's good carbs, there's bad carbs, there's complex carbs, there's simple carbs. And it can get really confusing and people just want to go back to potato chips and just go on. But it's important because in this world where we're worried about our health care, we're worried about our family and our, our children's health, we don't want people sick. We're worried about the adequacy of, of health coverage and, and the toxic symptoms that come along with drugs. We've got to take what we eat as a primary thing of concern if we want to have good health, good mental health, I believe, and a whole host of things. And actually even, you know, if you get the right foods, I think you can actually save some money instead of wasting a lot of money on, on junk food. And so I, I tend to be an advocate of a heavy meat diet. I am not sponsored by the Cattlemen's Association, but they're welcome to give me a call and we'll talk as long as they're not hurting their cows. We want nice, healthy, happy cows. I don't know what they do. But in the meantime, we're going to have a discussion tonight. We're going to have a panel. And so joining me to be the moderator of this discussion is our chief science advisor, Dr. Wei Ping Yu. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. And thank you for coming. You know, you're a physicist, so you understand what's going on at an atomic level. So I'm sure this is all going to be a fun, beautiful, exciting exploration of science. This is our Science and You show. It involves you and science. And we also have... A great friend, uh, a guest in tonight in our studio, Cal Mamunes. He is a, as I say your last name right? Ma- Close enough. Perfect. Mamunes, right? Try to. I say Mamunes. Okay. But... Okay. I would put too much Latin or something, I think. Uh, but thank you for coming on. You have a PhD in nutrition at Rutgers University, right? That's right. And uh, you're very, very well read and v- you understand these uh, topics very well. And you. You were a carnivore diet. You've done the keto thing, and you then excluded to meat only, and I think uh, some really extreme experimentation, uh, and ultimately you decided that wasn't for you. And uh, that's and so you've moved on into a different, more nuanced perspective, right. and uh, that involves the idea that, um, you know, that you can have some types of, uh, you know, plant foods and, and, and carby foods, fruits and uh, tubers and things like that, honey maybe, you, you can talk about it in more detail. But you're here to talk about the, how carbohydrates may have a function for healthy, long-term, optimal living. And then joining us via New York City, he is uh, one of the leading advocates of the carnivore diet, someone who eats zero carbs pretty much. He eats primarily animal-based foods, Frank Tafano. How you doing, Frank? No, how are you guys? Uh, Doing great. So we have Kyle and Frank here, and we're going to talk today about what is the primary fuel that our body craves. Is it fats? Now, we all agree that vegetable oils are not a good thing, right? No one likes vegetable oil, so we're taking that off the table. So it's not all fats. We're talking about animal fats, 
and uh, and then carbohydrates. I think Kyle, you would say that uh, a lot of the uh, you know plants like kale and stuff we shouldn't be eating. That is that right, or, or I don't know where you go on that. Yeah, I think that's over. Well, yeah, I don't. So a lot of plants that people eat are overrated in terms of their health impact. You would say. Would yeah, you? especially the low calorie ones that are supposedly high in minerals. I think a lot of that's you know indigestible. You have to cook it a lot. Kind of tastes crappy. Right. So kale. It. Yeah. So so Michelle Obama was not doing America justice by trying to get everybody to eat kale and arugula in the White House garden, right? She was doing some kale farmers justice. <laughs> okay. And then, uh, Frank, uh, you also, you eat only animal products primarily, is that right? Yeah. So, so all right, I'm going to throw it off to you uh, um, first, Frank, since you're joining us uh, in New York City. Kyle's got hometown advantage. He's, a, he's doing work at University of Central Florida in Orlando. So what's your, what's your you, know, you know, helicopter view perspective on fats versus carbs? Do we need a mixture of both to optimally live as humans? This is an interesting question because we have to kind of look at what the diets of healthy people were. And regardless of the location, there was a large percentage of a caloric intake from animal foods averaging between 45 and 65 percent and the higher percentage groups of people tended to be in better health you know there were some you know indigenous groups of people that were around 75 80 85 percent that were taller uh, i would guess physically stronger than other groups of people but regardless of where humans existed on this planet approximately 55 percent of their calories came from animal nutrition this could have been, you know, raw sheep dairy. This could have been, you know, fish they were catching out of the Mediterranean Sea. This could have been bison they were hunting in the plains. This could have been, you know, Eskimos, or First Nation Alaskans, Inuit that were consuming seal, walrus, caribou, whatever it may be. And the point is that all of these animal foods have specific nutrients, vitamins, minerals, elements, and fatty acids that are key to, to human growth and development. And there's also the element of survival. So let's say we have these nutrients from animal foods uh, that are needed to you know, develop human beings, uh, to grow, uh, to perform basic metabolic function. There's al also that element of survival and the need for caloric intake in the form of you know, fat or carbohydrates. Humans can you know, use protein for energy to some degree, but ideally in all circumstances, in all of these groups of people, 70 to 80 percent of that caloric intake was an energy source. So whether it was animal fat or whether it was roots, tubers, uh, and in some more recent agricultural civilizations, things like rye bread and wheat bread and certain preparations of the various plant foods that are farmed now, there's you know, both the need for nutrition from animal foods, yet we need to obtain energy sources from either carbohydrates or fat in order to be in an optimal energy metabolism. And the body can deal with different sources of energy in various ways. And, and of course, you have, you know, different metabolic pathways for, uh, you know, when, when starches get really complicated and every single plant food needs to be addressed on a subjective basis. And you could theorize all you want about, you know, the sugar ratios, the complex versus the simple carbohydrates. But the point is that whatever carbohydrate these groups of people consumed, it was because it was what was in their environment. And, and what was necessary for them to literally survive. You know, these people didn't necessarily want to eat, uh, you know, grains like rye or wheat or whatever it was, but it was what they had in their environment and, and what they could use uh, to, to last through the winter or whatever it was. Yes, some of these groups of people did prefer to get uh, their caloric energy source from the bison fat because that was plentiful. But if you had, you know, a coastal African tribe that can only procure fish that was very lean – then they would have had to obtain a lot of their energy, their caloric energy from plant food. And it's, it's really interesting that, you know, the nine to five job of these people, their lives, their focus was literally survival. So their knowledge of foods and the foods in their environment uh, far eclipsed what we had today. You know, we're not talking about, you know, a few different foods. We're talking about hundreds of different types of animal foods. You know, they might have had 10 different species of one fish, you know, let alone the hundreds of different of types of ocean life they consume. They could have consumed thousands of different, you know, wild plants that were in their environment. 
uh, you know, what we've been exposed to today uh, ha- has really been simplified uh, from what our ancestors used to do from that perspective. But the point is that you know, regardless of whether they consumed carbohydrates for energy or they consumed animal foods for energy, they were all in excellent physical health. It's just that during the developmental stages of life, the more animal foods that they consumed, their stature, their physical development was very different. And then there's also some other environmental factors that, that play in here. But Let's take a quick commercial break. That's Frank Tofano. He's a leading carnivore diet advocate. And on the other side, we're going to hear from Kyle, our in-studio guest, who's going to show us another perspective. We'll be right back in just a second, live on A Neighbor's Choice. Let's dance in sky. Hello, this is David Gronoski here, your neighborhood political exorcist. Tonight we're doing our Science in You show. That's you and science come together for a live dance of information, discourse, and learning new things. The things that you don't hear. We slay sacred cows on this show each night. And so joining me in studio is Dr. Yu, our chief science advisor and physicist. And we have uh, Kyle, Dr. Kyle. He's a nutrition uh, expert. Uh, he from Rutgers University, and now he's at University of Central Florida. And then joining us live from New York is Frank Tofano, a advocate of the carnivore diet. So I asked uh, before the break for Frank's perspective on the what's better, fats, uh, animal fats, or you know carbohydrates, or some mixture. And he made a case for uh, animal nutrition being the primary fuel uh, based on ancestors, our ancestors. So Kyle, I want to take it to you now. So what's your perspective? on, you know, what you've heard so far? Well, I don't disagree with uh, very much. I, in the sense that I think that a healthy diet should always contain uh, a, a, a lot of animal foods, maybe maybe the majority. Um, it depend- I think that animal protein is superior to plant protein and animal fats are superior to plant fats. But as far as, I, I think that the ancestral case is uh, maybe overstated in some of the anthropological literature. I know recently there was a a little kerfuffle a few years ago. Somebody was observing. um, There's very few, you know, untouched tribes left, you know, tribes that are hunting and gathering and aren't using modern foods. And there was one that was observed, and their men would leave um, the, the campsite for days at a time to collect honey. Uh, a couple times a year, and they consider this an extremely important thing to do. And it got me thinking, it got a lot of people thinking that maybe, um, although, of course, finding animal remains, remains of tools and things to cook animal foods uh, is great evidence that a lot of animal foods were used in the past, the absence of plant foods, because, you know, uh, if if you're consuming honey or if you're collecting... Uh, plants, they might not leave as much remains over geological time as something like an animal bone or an implement for getting marrow out of an animal bone or something like that. Right. So I actually think that, um, you know, a lot of peoples, even the Inuit, uh, have put some effort into collecting carbohydrates and also that, you know, whale blubber, th- there's a, a bit of a debate about how much glycogen, they, they store their glycogen different than know us of course they you know they have blubber they have a lot of things that land animals don't land mammals don't have um so i i actually think like the carnivore the standard of ancient human nutrition being carnivore is maybe not a a wrapped up case academically uh frank any thoughts on that what is the argument that the the carbohydrate i mean yeah there's a carbohydrate present in in ancestral diets but if you actually put yourself in the context of that environment, I, I think honey is a very, uh, a very specific example. That's not a food that was present in in many parts of the world. Uh, if you're going to actually look at the caloric load of plant foods and what it takes to obtain those plant foods, uh, it, it doesn't really make sense from any perspective. Uh, you know, if you're if you're looking at wild plant foods and the caloric intake, even if you had unlimited access to blueberries as a human being. 
if, if all you ate was blueberries, you, you would still lose weight over a period of, of days or weeks, whatever it was. Uh, so that they might be, as I mentioned, an adjunct to a diet for like a caloric intake to replicate those energy calories if you don't have other things to access. But one thing we did see in, in every group of people, uh, you know, we, we didn't see honey gathering frequently because it's, that's specific to certain parts of the world. But what we did see was specific gathering of animal foods during times of uh, fertility. Uh, you had Australian Aborigines, for example, mm -hmm. and who would gather these moths from a cave. So as you, you said, those people would, you know, go away for the camp for days at a time uh, to gather the honey. These Aborigines would go up the mountains into these caves where these moths were breeding on, on the side of these cave walls. And then the walls were just completely covered with moths. And these insects were very fatty. They were very high in vitamins. And, and they would eat these moths. They would essentially, uh, I mean, you know, make babies. And, and they would even gather some of these and, and dry them and take them back to the campsite. And whether it was eating, you know, fatty moths like this or, you know, gathering specific parts of fish like fish roe, fish eggs, or, or gathering organ meats like uh, kidneys and liver to feed the pregnant and nursing woman. Uh, you know, the Swiss used to, to gather the summer dairy uh, that was very rich in, in nutrients from the pasture grass. We see these habits of gathering very high animal nutrient foods during times of fertility in all indigenous people. And... Uh, we also see a uh, presence of fermented animal foods in all of these people, and, and that's something that's, that's across all, all of these groups. Yes, there was some plant food consumption, but one group of people might have literally only eaten rye bread, and another group of people might have eaten thousands of different uh, plant foods, and then you might have another group of people that uh, subsisted on oats. So there's a plant food variance in these groups of people, but there isn't an animal food variant. They all have certain nutrients from the animal foods. They all have certain preparations of the animal foods, and they have gathering habits that are specific to fertility. Kyle, do you want to respond to that, or do you want to move on to another, anything to clarify about that? Um, well, uh, are you familiar with the, the Weston A. Price Nutrition and Physical Degeneration book? Yeah, you know, that's, I'm referring, you have the Swiss people in that book who, you know, they ate rye, they yeah. had South Sea Islanders who gather plant foods. Yeah, I, I, I do think that it's absolutely true that for good health, you know, these peoples without access to, like, supplements or anything like that, they needed um, f the fat-soluble vitamins and probably some other things, maybe even things that haven't been fully characterized yet scientifically from animal foods, maybe even from specific parts of the animal uh, to be healthy, but I think they also all, you know, consume a decent amount of carbs, at least in that book. And that, you know, that was a hundred years ago. Things are even worse for traditional peoples now in terms of existing. There's less and less of them to study, but I, I just don't think that the, um, I just think that there's been more carb consumption in these populations than is being discussed in this sort of like, it just feels like a romantic kind of carnivore story. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, without a doubt, if you actually do analyze, as I said earlier, you know, 55% calories from animal foods, these, these people were consuming a considerable amount of carbohydrates, but it doesn't seem that it was their choice. It seems like based on the environment and the food that they had access to, they were consuming, I would say, any of these plant foods out of necessity. When you did have groups of people that had a very high access to animal foods because they were proficient hunters, uh, such as like the Native Americans who hunted plains bison. They were consuming very high percentages of their calories from animal foods, like 80, 90 percent. And they still kept some plant foods present in their diet, whether it was because they enjoyed them or to season their food or, or some, some traditional preparations of certain things. But a lot of people downplay how, how difficult it actually was you know, to, to, to even survive in any environment, let alone, you know, choose what you get to eat. You know, trying to obtain enough animal nutrition to get a high percentage of your calories is, is something that's incredibly difficult to do. We're talking with Dr. Uh, Frank Mamunes. He is a Ph.D. in biochemistry, 
right? Biochemistry or nutrition? Which would uh, uh, nutritional nutrition science. science? Nutritional science. He's from University of Central Florida, and we also have Frank Tofano, who's a popular advocate of the carnivore diet on YouTube. Uh, he's very uh, you know popular in those circles, and I think this is a great discussion. I want to move to the modern time, you know, like what we know about what's going on in the body now. So, uh, Kyle. Uh, as a nutritionist, you've looked at the effects of eating a ketogenic diet, right? You've looked mm-hmm. at what happens when the body is getting its primary fuel from ketones, which is everybody's talking about keto diets. And what did you find there that made you move away from being a carnivore? Well, I think the ketones are great. Um, they're, they're, I think they're an unimpeachable fuel source in that sense, except there's some acetone conversion, which can't be used from one of the Prime, two primary ketones that, you know, aside from that, um, the, the main concern I have is the physiological state necessary to produce the ketones is um, it kind of, it's related to like the same thing that would happen in a situation of like a starvation, you know, fasting, fasting does the same thing. Uh, cert, uh, cortisol, catecholamines. Um, and so I think that it, it seems like that the body has that as a backup. It just seems that way. You know, if you eat a little bit of, if you eat too much protein even, let alone too much carbohydrate, you'll fall out of ketosis. And it just seems to me like if that was the uh, preferred fuel of the body, then it would almost be like you would have to, uh, it would be the other way around where you'd be using the fatty acids and then you'd have to kind of cut back on those in order to use glucose. So you're saying the body prefers to switch to glucose when it can get a hold of it, even if it has to convert protein into, glu- into glucogen, right? Or is that or glu- like what's glucose? The, yeah, glucose, gluconeogenesis. Yeah, yeah especially um, the brain, uh, the liver, the muscle when it's working. Well, that's very interesting. So on the other side, we're going to talk to Frank Tofano, a carnivore diet advocate. He eats only animal products, and see what's his perspective on that. Does the body prefer ketones for fuel or does it prefer carbohydrates and glucose? This is a big debate and it has a lot to impact our lives and our families. We'll continue live on A Neighbor's Choice. I'm David Gronoski. More to come. A Neighbor's Choice is back. I'm your host, David Gronoski. We're live here in Orlando, Florida. And we're talking about the great debate. The debate between carbs or fat. Now, we all agree in this room we don't want to eat vegetable oils. So that's off the table. Don't ever put that in your body, as far as I understand. But there's a big debate still, and it's a complicated debate about whether we should be on the keto diet or whether we should be enjoying carbohydrates. Now, in terms of what our choices are in America, carbs are winning big league, okay? Carbs are up. But this scrappy new movement of keto is really making a lot of uh, excitement online especially. And so we have Frank Tofano. He's a carnivore diet YouTube star, and he's... uh, all over there every day, analyzing the literature, making the case. And Frank, you've been on the carnivore, primarily animal foods only, for how long? Yeah, we're coming up on seven years now. Seven years, and you feel great, huh? Doing good so far. Does it, does it, do you feel stressed being on the diet? Does it give you a lot of uh, lack of energy or stress or anxiety? No, it's, it's, it's very easy. Uh, I have a very, I mean, I have a very stressful job in general, you know, making videos every day, you know, working, uh, you know, with the meat company now, I, I get very little sleep, but the diet allows me to eat once a day, eat once every three days, go for very long times without eating, without sleeping. So uh, I don't think I would be capable of doing this on any other diet. Uh, but just, I mean, I'm sure, you know, if I had a less stressful lifestyle and, and then my life was a little bit easier in general, then I'd, I'd probably be consuming maybe less food or, or have a more normal meal frequency. But, I mean, yeah, everything I do is, is pretty extreme from the diet to what I do from my day to day. So, uh, I mean, if I was on standard American diet eating, even just seeing what other people are doing during the day and their time investment, uh, 
I don't think I would ever be able to to move back to something normal anyway. Uh, Natalie on our Facebook live stream asks uh, Kyle, why are babies in ketosis by default, but adults are not? And that's infant. That's newborn babies, right? They 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 have. And that's how long does that last? Typically, I don't know. Well, I don't. Default is it's a tricky word. I mean, they're not constantly in ketosis. They can go into ketosis much more easily than adults. And the reason why they have a different relationship with food than adults. So they, there's, they also have basically a layer of blubber, um, that, that adults, you know, hopefully don't have. And I would say that there's a, a difference in, um, so they they have small livers compared to yet they use, you know, their metabolism is higher than adults. So it, it babies need to be able to have something like fat that actually is a longer lasting fuel source than something like a glycogen storage. So that they eat more easily switch over into using fats than adults because it w- it's really, really bad if a, a growing baby is um, energy depleted, mm-hmm. whereas an adult, it's not as big of a deal. It's the same reason why like men and women's bodies are built differently. There's evolutionary reasons for things like that. That's what I would say. So Frank, what let's let's unpack what you know Kyle was saying uh, in general. Um, uh, Kyle, you you're not saying that uh, animal f- fats are bad. We should he- eat a lot of animal products. Right. But you're saying that to burn your fuel primarily through uh, ketosis is is that stressful on the body? Is that is that something that's not healthy? Your body doesn't want to stay there. Well, yeah, I, of- I I think that so the the ketones you know so you get your fatty acids from the diet and also from the fat stores so whenever you're consuming you're burning mostly fats you're getting this mixture of like stored fat and dietary fat and what liberates that and allows you to burn that is um, a whole set of hormones and and those hormones are are basically related to the same ones that like if you were starving what would happen mm-hmm. and you know that that seems stressful to me. Frank, what do you think? Is that a stressful place to put your body in? I don't think there's any a group of indigenous people that would not be in a ketogenic metabolism. If, first, you have to understand how you actually have to procure carbohydrates in a natural environment. So there's no point in talking about honey or fruit because those foods require far more caloric expenditure than, than obtaining them. Even, even if you found a whole beehive's worth of honey, uh, one, your your body can only process so much sugar at once, so many carbohydrates at once. Uh, two, you you would have already burned off the calories that were used to obtain that fruit or that honey. How do you fight uh, off all those could, bees? Either that's what I want to. Well, back then, I mean, there, there are indigenous, like a lot of they these smoke. indigenous people smoke. had a lot okay. of like various methods to whether it's using smoke and fire or some. I mean, but these people were, you know, they're wild animals essentially. They're different right. human beings. They they tolerate things differently, but. If, if you're able to put humans in a realistic setting where they can pur- procure carbohydrates on a consistent basis, that's the Neolithic Revolution. That's agriculture. So if, if we spend, you know, there, there's something to be said about tools and using farming methods, modern agricultural methods, to obtain unnatural amounts of carbohydrate calories. But every single group of people that consumed a large percentage of their car- calories from carbohydrates, like rye bread or wheat bread or rice, they were in the fields for eight, nine, 10 hours a day growing these foods. They were hiking for, you know, 10, 12, 14 hours a day gathering these foods. How they, that's how they were, they were getting them. So you can't have a high carbohydrate presence in the diet without being incredibly physically active, 10, 12, 14 hours a day of very rigorous labor to grow those foods. So it's debatable that if you, all these people burn those carbohydrates off as they gather them. And I don't think that these people would have ever been outside of a ketogenic metabolism in the context of their diet. And especially if you're talking about, you know, these, uh, the ancestral people who were consuming wild animal and plant food, you know, the level of activity in these people, you know, they, they would burn any, any plant food calories off, you know, throughout the day uh, and then enter back into a ketogenic state. The, the caloric burn is absurd. And how readily we have carbohydrates accessible and our lack of physical activity I believe has allowed us to get out of the ketogenic state. Uh, I don't even, the, you know, the the line that's drawn between ketosis and not being in ketosis is, is something I don't think was ever meant to happen. And it, it doesn't make sense because even if you, 
there, there's no group of people that would have ever had consistent access to carbohydrates on a daily basis. They would have always been in and out of ketosis on, on a regular basis, and uh, especially considering the physical activity required to obtain these foods. Cal, so, I mean, do, do you believe that uh, carbohydrate consumption, uh, it, you know, having sugar as a prevalent factor of your diet, alongside animal foods, animal product, products, does that create insulin resistance? Uh, I don't think so. As long as you're not, um, as long as you're not getting, uh, it, there's a bacterial product called endotoxin that, that's why the whole microbiome thing has been popular recently and people can, can have weight loss sometimes altering their microbiome with these probiotics. Um, whenever it's been studied clinically, people that, uh, have either insulin resistance symptoms or obesity, they have what's called postprandial endotoxemia. So they have this chemical in their blood after eating. And whether somebody's on a high fat diet or a high sugar diet, if they don't have this postprandial endotoxemia, then they don't tend to store extra fat. But I would I I want to go back to the um the ketosis question about, you know, wild peoples. Uh I'm not aware of any wild peoples that have been brought that have been studied that are in ketosis, including the Inuit, that every time they've been studied they're not in ketosis and Inuit peoples, the most carnivorous peoples of our time actually have this characteristic mutation that increases their gluconeogenesis. So their ability to make glucose from protein, you know, the animal protein that they're eating. And they are even more resistant to ketosis than like you or I would be with, without this mutation. And, um, I think there was, there's been a couple studies that have shown that these people are in ketosis, but it requires them to be fasted for a day. So is, if they're not fasted for a day, they're not in ketosis. But a lot of people... So why weren't they in ketosis if they were eating primarily animal foods? Were they getting honey somewhere, sneaking honey? They were getting... Uh, it's it suggested that they were getting a lot of glycogen from certain types of whales and that they have an improved ability to make glucose from protein. Is that whale fat really honey sweet? Delicious? <laughs> it seems to have a starchy layer. It, they oh. called it animal starch. Frank, what do you think of that? Uh, I, I think we have to take a step back and just say, you know, what are we, what are we talking about? We mean like a low state of blood sugar and the body is using fat for energy. But, but to say that humans weren't using, you know, fat and protein from animal foods as their primary energy sources, it's a bit outlandish, but I mean, if we want to talk about the, the macronutrient composition of animal foods based on the glycogen, when an animal dies, you have, there are three enzymes to my knowledge in, in the, the flesh. You have fat hydrolyzing enzymes, you have proteolytic enzymes, and you have glycolytic enzymes. Glycolytic enzymes, as soon as the animal dies, turn the glycogen into lactic acid. This happens very, very quickly. Uh, you have the proteolytic enzymes break down the protein as the meat ferments, and the fat hydrolyzing enzymes ferment the fat as the fat ferments. Uh, the the only the only the, the amount of glycogen present in uh, in these foods it, it's it's an unrealistic it's an unrealistic thing to say. Well, I would say that's true for land they, animals, but I, I just specifically whales they have a different I believe they have a different relationship with their glycogen. Um, stores, but that's definitely true of land animal, uh, land mammals. Frank, did you know there was some sugar sneaking up in the starchy uh, whale fat? I've never, I mean, listen, I've read a lot of information on, I've never heard of gly a glycogen layer or some sort of glycogen con or carbohydrate containing fat layer in a, in a whale. Well, we're just uh, down the, the road from SeaWorld. We're going to have to ask him what Shamu's <laughs> all about. Is he sweet? We'll take a quick commercial break. We're going to continue this, Frank. We'll get to you on the other side, and we'll continue debating fats versus carbs, carnivore versus carbs on the other side. We're live on A Neighbor's Choice, and it's science and you tonight. Hello, are you there? It's a neighbor's choice in Science and You tonight. Every Thursday night, we do Science and You. That means we bring you together with our chief science advisor, Dr. You, a brilliant physicist and person who can unlock a lot of uh, wisdom about 
what's going on in the natural world. And we have two special guests here, Frank Tofano. You can find him on YouTube. Look up Frank Tofano and subscribe to his uh, YouTube channel. He's got uh, thousands and thousands of views, tens of thousands of views on every video. He's doing a good job at explaining his case. He's been eating animals only for seven years, and he's uh, and, and he's feels like he's better than ever. And then we also have uh, our friend Kyle, and he is a uh, Ph.D. in nutrition. And so he's from University of Central Florida, so he's got the hometown court here in Orlando. And uh, we were just talking about uh, whale fat. I want to get a hold of that. Is it illegal to buy whale blubber? I want to try that and fry that up. I want that sweet without even having to use maple, uh, you know, sweetener, huh? But uh, I want to turn over to Dr. Yu now because he's our physicist, and he, take it away. Okay. Um, I have a question. Uh, first question is for uh, Frank. Um, so you prefer carnivore diet. Um, my question is, does, carniv- does animal food contain all the necessary nutrition a human body needs? All vitamins, minerals, elements, fatty acids, yes. Oh, so that's the reason you have the most extreme version of a carnivore diet. So you basically eliminated a uh, carbohydrate, uh, you know, a plant food. Is that right? Yes. Do you see during your seven years, okay, do you see any adverse effect by completely eliminated a uh, plant food? Adverse effects, no. I mean, I mean, if you remove, if you remove any food from your diet for a period of time, your ability to tolerate that food goes away. But once you reintroduce it, you can eat it again. Oh, you said the body adapt to the to the food environment. Okay, so I have the same questions for Kyle. So you you think a carbohydrate you know food actually body preferred in your opinion? So does carbohydrate food contain all the necessary nutrition human body needs? Uh, no, no. I think you need animal foods for sure. So what is the proportion, right? The proportion, I believe people, audience wanted to know. Oh, okay. Um, I do think that that is a matter of some individual, like whether genetic or, you know, whatever your background is, uh, difference. I think maybe like a balanced diet, like a third protein, a third fat, and a third carbohydrate might be a decent um, part to start. Maybe maybe more like um, more like 40% fat. And, and take that away from, you know, maybe 25% proteins, and, you know, something like that, something that's relatively balanced, I think is a good place to start. But you wouldn't prefer, you wouldn't recommend people just eat like the standard uh, pyramid sign, you know, the food pyramid thing of like seven to 11 servings of bagels and stuff every day, right? <laughs> well, right. there's a lot of, you know, a lot of problems with, um, you know, it's kind of like how there's a lot of studies that say, oh, look, this meat is bad. And in the category of meat, they'll have like um, pepperoni pizza. Mm-hmm. as the you know because it has meat on it <laughs> this is this is a real thing like if you watch um like there's that fathead documentary i forget what the guy is but he he kind of rips apart a lot of the stuff well they do the same thing with um carbohydrates like you could say i mean our like our grain supply actually by law is fortified with b vitamins and with iron mm-hmm. like iron filings and that's just bad news right. um so there, there's like some countries there's an argument that in countries that don't fortify their grain supply with iron they don't get the same negative effects that's, that's a whole other and, thing and you wouldn't recommend people eat sugary fruit that's not that's been so hybridized with tons of sugar it's totally un, un you know unrecognizable from the wild roots of these fruits right these seedy little tiny tiny mini melons that the watermelon came from it's nasty looking you look at the photos and stuff <laughs> and little wild strawberries are as small as a small pig's uh, uh toe you know yeah no i i don't i don't know um about that i there's something a little grotesque about fruit that doesn't grow seeds. Right. Um, but I don't, I don't really think, I mean, the animals that we eat are, you know, not like the wild ones. What about, what about cruciferous vegetables like broccoli and cauliflower and that kind of thing? No, I don't really like those. Stay away from those. Those are not good Especially for you. raw. Don't eat them raw. I so don't re- do a raw vegan diet, folks, right? Well, I mean, is it okay? I mean, I don't yeah, want... don't do a raw vegan diet for other reasons, but don't eat. The... <laughs> yeah, you could eat. Fr- I mean, fruits okay raw, right? You know, but the a lot of these things like, you know, the cruciferous, they have like real toxins that are deactivated by cooking. Any more questions? Um, uh, okay, so maybe um, ask Frank. So, you know, do you have any favorite vegetable food in in your uh, maybe not in your diet, in your life? 
I used to work as a chef, and uh, and I've you know worked front of house in restaurants for uh, for a while uh, for many years when I was younger. So I definitely have like a culinary inclination towards you know appreciating ingredients, understanding what quality is. Uh, that that's something I tie I tie a lot into my animal food preparation. But you know when I cook for my family or when I cook for other people, uh, I do uh, enjoy corpor- incorporating certain plant foods uh, in, into the cooking, and I, I go for high quality. Yeah, uh, heirloom quality food. So you know, using an einkorn wheat instead of a modern white flour. Uh, you know, using wild rice instead of uh, you know the many types of rice we see in the store right now. There's definite quality plant foods uh, that I deem acceptable to incorporate into any diet. The issue is, you know, these plant foods are typically far more expensive than consuming the animal counterpart in our modern world. You know, a, a wild plant food now is a luxury, whereas back then it was what these people kind of ate out of necessity and and would have preferred the animal foods. Now, you know, people are literally going out and paying, you know, top dollar, uh, like they're paying a lot more per calorie for for plant foods than they could be for animal foods right now. So so if you put in, you know, an indigenous person or uh, someone that needs to survive in the context of, of our food access now, a lot of the the plant foods would be brushed away for either either high caloric ones or ones that were just preferred for a taste perspective. Frank, are mushrooms uh, not as bad for us generally as uh, plants? Assuming you know, besides the poisonous mushrooms, you know, they are their bot. That's a whole other kingdom than plants. Are they, you know, they 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 are closer to humans on some things. I mean, are they better to eat if you're going to add something besides meat into your lifestyle? Uh, I'm gonna be. So I've been asked a lot about mushrooms. I haven't done a complete research and write-up on it, but you have to understand that, you know, those white button mushrooms, those portobello mushrooms, those cremini mushrooms you're buying in the supermarket, uh, those aren't something that you want to look at for for some sort of health benefit. If we actually took, uh, you know, a wild mushroom, a chanterelle, a very high – basically, people aren't going to have access to to mushrooms that are what I would consider of high quality – uh, enough to consume, but if the question is like, is a is like a button mushroom worse for you than than kale? Uh, there's subjective things in in each of these plant foods that have to be addressed. Okay, you know what's the anti nutrient profile? Right. What hap- What's the, how does it digest? What was sprayed on it? How how was it grown? Uh, every plant food is, is incredibly subjective, and and it varies from you know the type of mushroom to you know the, the way it's grown. And and there was I don't know what this is off the top of my head, but there was a concern of some type of substance that occurs specifically in mushrooms uh, that that doesn't occur in other plant foods. So I'll have to I'll have to get back to you on that one. But there there is definitely because uh, people like mushrooms and mushrooms. steak, you know, and there's some healthy, you know, like shaga mushroom tea has loads of uh, good stuff in it. They say, and it's a it's uh, kind of a different thing than plants. Uh, Jordan uh, comments on our Facebook live stream. He says, "I work a very laborious job for ten to twelve hours daily." and feel horrible on carbs consistently with pretty bad gut and joint problems. All employees stay sick eating high carbs, and a high animal fat diet makes me feel amazing all day, no gut problems, high energy, and he says some even moderate carbs, and it still feels sick when he does it. So there's something for to think about. I want to ask both of you, if this was your last meal and you were on death row, what would your last meal be? Oh, let's go with uh, Frank first. Oh man, that's a tough question. I would, I would definitely, uh, off the top of my head, uh, probably the I make an ice cream from very high quality animal food. So I'll take some, you know, some pastured egg yolks. I'll take some like raw dairy, like grass fed, like cream and milk. And I'll take some local wildflower honey. I'll take some like, uh, like wild vanilla bean. Very expensive ice cream to make, but it's probably one of the best things I've ever tasted. Uh, by far that that would be that would be a, a food that's up there and in regards to animal foods i've always loved like really high quality pasture raised goose liver and duck liver well and, check and out probably have check out frankie's free range meat to learn more about frankie's favorite meat he sells it it's good stuff and kyle what would your last meal be uh hagen white i think it's white raspberry chocolate uh a bag of hers red hot potato chips and um Maybe some chicken wings with McCormick hot wing bag in season. <laughs> Sounds electrifying to me. Good thing they abolished the electric chair because that's not the kind of electric we want. Doctor, you any 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 uh, food you'd eat? 
Oh, um, you know, I just love eat the rice. So that's oh, carbohydrate. That's that rice. So. All right. We're going to sign off there, folks. Fats versus carbs. The battle will rage on, but we've done a good job tonight. You're listening to A Neighbor's Choice. Email me, david, at a neighborschoice.com. Godspeed.